Hello and welcome to Melton Vineyard's online service. Our vision as a church can be summed up in three words. Bless, serve, pray. We want to bless others with the unconditional love of Jesus that we've experienced. We will serve each other and the wider community and we will pray so we can do all this in the power of God's Spirit. Our vision for these online services is that they're a space where you can explore faith and discover what kind of church we are at your own pace and in your own way. Each week we share a worship song and a short talk which we hope you'll find encouraging and helpful. And if you believe that Melton Vineyard might be a church you could call home and you live in or near the Melton area, then we would love to welcome you to one of our on-site services, which are every Sunday morning, 10.30am, at John Fernley College. So let's pray. Father God, please meet with us through your Holy Spirit as we turn our hearts and our thoughts towards you now. In Jesus' name, Amen.
Morning. Hello, everybody. My name's George, off of George and Caroline, and um, it's lovely to see you all. Some new faces as well, which is great. Welcome, uh, especially if this is your first time here. Uh, I'll start with a question before I get into today's talk. Have you ever felt like you're at a crossroads with an important decision to make that could change everything? You ever felt like that? And many of you are in that place today. Maybe it could be a relationship, your career, or what to do when you're facing serious problems or things ahead of you and how to make a decision on it. I think we've all been there at some point. And maybe, you know, you're sat here thinking about which is the way to go and the consequences of that decision. The Bible is full of people who have had to make tough decisions and live with the consequences. And I thought for this morning's talk, which two characters would be better in our contrast in the Bible series to look at than the lives of King Saul and King David? Both of them had similarities. Both were chosen by God. Both were anointed by the prophet Samuel. Both were empowered by the Spirit of God. Both became king aged 30 and reigned for about 40 years. And it's interesting that despite how many similarities they had, their lives took very different paths. As I've been reading 1 and 2 Samuel over the last few weeks, I found myself very much aware of my own need for God's help. As, um, yeah, one of the great things about the Bible is it doesn't, it's not only written what happened, but it also shines a light on the condition of our own hearts. And I have to say... Um, after studying the lives of Paul, uh, sorry, Saul and David, I confess that I see something of myself in each of them. I recall times when I've made decisions based on fear and pain that's led to more fear and pain as a result, or where I've reacted to situations and rushed it and it's not gone well. But I can also think of decisions I've made based on faith and love that have brought me closer to God's will and his plan for my life. And like the rest of the human race, Saul and Paul were both very flawed human beings. Um, and in spite of the fact that David had made some big mistakes, he was still remembered after a, as a man after God's own heart, while Saul was remembered as this kind of tragic uh, figure who couldn't overcome his own insecurities and his need for approval. So today I want us to look at how we can overcome our Saul-like tendencies into proactive David-type habits and decision-making. So when Saul was to be announced as the first king of Israel, the prophet Samuel gathered all the tribes of Israel together to let them know that Saul had been chosen to be king, but he disappeared. So the Bible says, um, in verse 22, so Samuel asked the Lord, where is he? And the Lord replied, he's hiding among the baggage. <laughs> it's not a great start to a, to a king. Um, but this kind of sums up Saul's life, really. And the things I want to say about him today is, it's very rarely in the Bible that we get to see Saul's greatness. He had greatness in him. But it's very rarely we get to see it because of his baggage. That he appears to be hiding in and living in that place of his own sort of emotional baggage. And it's detrimental to his conduct and his decision-making. And one particular story I'm going to start with as we read, it's from 1 Samuel chapter 15. And this is where God is about to carry out uh, a divine judgment on the Amalekites for when they attacked God's people, coming out of slavery to the Promised Land hundreds of years before Saul was about. And these people attacked the, all the weak people, basically, everyone that was at the back. Uh, leading, uh, leaving Egypt, leaving uh, slavery, all these guys came and just attacked them uh, for no reason. And there was many other practices and things that were pretty bad about the Amalekites that weren't great, that I won't go into. But uh, the prophet Samuel says to Saul, basically, God chose you to be king. Now go and completely destroy the Amalekites, all the people, all the animals, everything, totally wipe them out. Which seems pretty straightforward. I mean, it doesn't, in our Time now, that seems pretty harsh, uh, which it, it is. But if you, see, if you see the context in which it's in, it's part of a fulfillment of what God was trying to achieve through that. And Saul had pretty clear instructions there. 
But it says, then Saul, in verse 7, then Saul slaughtered the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the king, the Amalekite king, and completely destroyed everyone else. Saul, sent, uh, Saul and his men spared Agag's life and kept the best of the sheep, the goats, the cattle, the fat calves and the lambs, everything in fact, that appealed to them. They destroyed only what was worthless or of poor quality. So Samuel hears about this from God uh, and what Saul's done and goes to look for him, but Saul has set up a monument in his own honour and uh, it's not going well, is it, when you're reading it, you're going, oh no. And then uh, Samuel finally meets him and Saul says, oh yeah, I've done everything that God told me to. And then Samuel is uh, saying in verse 14, then what's all this bleating of sheep and goats and the lowing of cattle I can hear? Surely, surely that, here we go, the army spared the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, Saul admitted. But they, they were going to go and sacrifice it to the Lord your God. We have destroyed everything else. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop, listen to what the Lord told me last night. What did he tell you, Saul asked. And Samuel told him, although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you, king of Israel, and the Lord has sent you on a mission and told you, go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they're all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord and why did you rush for the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? But I did obey the Lord, Saul insisted. I carry out the mission he gave me. I brought back King Agag, but I destroyed everyone else. Then my troops brought in the best of the sheep, goats, cattle and the plunder to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice. Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than the, fat, the offering of the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft, and stubbornness as bad as worshipping idols. So because you've rejected the command of the Lord, he's rejected you as king. Then Saul admitted to Samuel, yes, I've sinned, I've disobeyed your instructions, and the Lord's command, and this is the real thing of it here for I was afraid of the people and I did what they demanded so that's the first point of Saul's issues is he's fearing people's opinions more than obeying God Saul was given, given a very specific command from the Lord and didn't follow it through and looked like he'd kind of succeeded even though Samuel knew and God both knew full well that he hadn't succeeded in, um, in obeying the Lord's command so are we only obedient up until the point it's convenient? Because I think this is a challenge to us. It's all right looking at Saul and going, oh, look at that guy. But really, this is what the Bible's about, isn't it? Sometimes, what can we take from these lives? And although that was specific instructions in that specific context, we've got commands from the Lord today. And do we want to follow them? Do we obey? Or is it sometimes a bit of a challenge to, uh, to do that um, when we are concerned about the, the thoughts and feelings of the people around us and how they might reject us. And that's why it's so important as well, with all the voices going on in the world today, that we spend time reading the Bible and time in prayer, that we can actually have our hearts softened to God, learning to hear his voice and, and his direction. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. And he also said this, in giving witness about himself, he said, no wonder you can't believe, for you gladly honour each other, but you don't care about the honour that comes from the one who alone is God. I wonder if Saul had some uh, big personalities on his team, and they'd somehow convinced him to take all the plunder, because some people can seem so convincing, can't they? You know, there can be people that seem a lot more forthright or confident than uh, we are, and we might think, because they're so confident... They must know more than we do. Um, and, a sh <laughs> yeah. and if we're not careful, we can go along with the wrong things because we want people's respect, even if it's not necessarily the right thing. Uh, and I'll share a quick story about how I fell into this trap myself. Um, that When I was in primary school, I had 
my best mate, basically, was the most confident and charismatic kid that's probably, I don't know, in a 20-mile radius of my house that I've probably still not met a kid that confident and charismatic. But uh, it, was a, it was our first time allowed in the village to play together. I think we were about nine. And um, he would be able to convince me that certain things were a great idea and bypass my own intuition or process of evaluating the danger of a situation. And um, we had this idea that we were going to build a den. But unfortunately, we didn't have any wood, so we kicked down a pub fence. <sighs> yeah, it's bad. It's bad. All I was thinking about was the den and not how to acquire the resources. I was so focused on the den that we kicked down a pub fence and I only came to the realisation of how much of a bad idea that was when I turned around with all the wood in my hand and the police were there. <laughs> and my friend could have beaten Usain Bolt in a running race that day, because I'll tell you what, by the time the police had arrived, he had already disappeared, and it wasn't like a cloud of dust. There wasn't even the dust off the car park. He was just, he had just gone. But I, <laughs> I couldn't deny it, because I had the wood in my hand. Uh, I couldn't blame my friend because he wasn't there, so I just had to stand there and take the telling off, basically, and the questioning as to what I'm doing with all this wood and a hole in the fence, and explain to the police that I needed it for my den <laughs> didn't justify my behaviour. But anyway, back to Saul. Um, so, so his disobedience is what cost him everything in the end, but there was also a number of things going on in Saul that weren't ideal. So he was making rash decisions, getting scared when people were leaving him, like before a battle. So he went and rushed in and offered sacrifices to God, which was a, uh, a thing that was only for the priests to do. He made a vow that nearly got his own son killed. He made his men weak by making them go without food in a battle. And when David starts to come on the scene, he gets a good reputation and Saul begins to start comparing himself to David and becomes really jealous and angry. And it might be something to do with the number one hit song that they were singing. Uh, Saul has killed his thousands, but David's his tens of thousands. So there's a pretty uh, good song for stirring up some serious jealousy in Saul. So he's fearful of people, he disobeys God, and he's also increasingly more jealous. And that's the second point of uh, Saul's issues. So jealousy and comparing ourselves to others Obviously, constantly comparing ourselves to other people through the lens of our own insecurity is going to bring resentment either to ourselves or to other people as we're thinking less of ourselves, more of them, and getting all twisted up. We can only do what God's asking us to do individually. We can only live the life that is ours. And it's when we're trying to control and hold uh, onto things and resentments about how other people seem to be doing better than us or are more successful than us, or have got this, or have got that, or whatever, it's not helpful to start applying all that judgment to your own life. You've got to live the life that God is calling you to, and be free to run that race for him. So Saul gets so jealous, this is what happens if you get too jealous, Saul ends up trying to kill David on a number of occasions. And it's that point in the story you start losing any sympathy that you had for Saul. Up until this point, you're kind of thinking, oh man, he's getting it wrong. But then when he starts uh, trying to kill David, it's not ideal. Um, so as we move on now to David, let's look at some more positive and helpful uh, things that we can do to overcome Saul-like behavior in our own lives. So the first thing David did was seeking and trusting in God. David had a lot of time to learn how to seek and trust God when he was a fugitive and on the run from Saul, who was running about all over the land trying to kill him with about 3,000 men. And so running from place to place, Saul and his men, it seems was a formative time for, for David to grow deeper in his trust for God and God's ability rather than his own ability. And when we're feeling afraid or overwhelmed or helpless, that's just another opportunity for each one of us to turn to God for his strength, for his encouragement. <laughs> And as I mentioned about how sometimes people might give us good ideas, but they're not necessarily God ideas, like my friend with the den. Um, David had some friends around him. While they were hiding in a cave and on the run from Saul, 
Uh, Saul went in the cave, the Bible says, to relieve himself. And David's men said to David, right now is your chance. This man's been following you, trying to kill you all this time. You're going to be king anyway. Kill him. Which sounds like a, quite a logical thing to do, probably, in that situation. And for some reason, David cut a piece of Saul's robe off and felt incredibly guilty about it. I mean, that shows how soft his heart was towards God, if you chop a bit of someone's garment off that's been trying to kill you on a few occasions. You, <laughs> I would think that's a, he's got off pretty lightly there, but you know. Um, so he spared Saul again later on, because he basically said, I will not... Um, I will not um, raise a hand against the Lord's anointed. So David was recognising that Saul's anointing was from God and he did not want to challenge that. In doing so, he would be challenging God. He spared Saul's life later on when Abishai snuck into Saul's camp and caught Saul sleeping. And Abishai says, I'll stab him through with my spear and pin him to the ground when he did a second shot. And David response is, no, don't kill him. Who can remain innocent after attacking the Lord's anointed one? Surely the Lord will strike Saul down someday, or he will die of old age or in battle. But the Lord forbid it that I should kill his anointed one. So this is quite, I think this is quite a contrast in itself to the times that David was living in. You know, it was probably quite a common thing for the, just go around sort of uh, executing people. Uh, that were in people's way, especially if they were uh, destined to be a king. And there, it was the same temptation the second time, only in a different format. The guy was saying, I'll kill, Dave, I'll kill Saul for you, David, the second time round. And sometimes that's how temptation comes to each one of us. It come, it's the same temptation in a different packaging. And we need to be wise and sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is saying, that we don't get uh, tricked. So the second habit that David uh, seemed to have that was going good was he sought God on big decisions. Have you ever felt so overwhelmed that you'll do everything except pray? I think Neil did a talk. How long ago was that with it? Don't, what was it? Why pray when you can panic? <laughs> there was a title or something. And, and that's just, you know, sometimes we can get so scared about something that we close up. And it's like, you have, it's like, you know, that sort of deer in the headlights sort of thing. You just freeze. And rather than seek God on a matter, you can just be scared, trying to work it all out, overthinking everything. And it's not healthy. It's scary. And um, David had some very scary decisions and times in his life, but he sought God on these big decisions. I mean, if you have a read through uh, the two books of Samuel, you'll see for yourself just how many opportunities David had to be terrified um, and there's a number of times recorded in there that David asked God what to do David didn't just rush in like Saul would occasionally rush in and do something crazy and then think about it later uh, there was a time when the Philistines attacked and rather than just going back and attacking them David said God should I engage in the battle he asked where he should live he sought God's will in bringing back the uh, Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem and he sought God in whether or not to pursue the Amalekites after Ziklag was attacked. That's where him and his men were all going around, left the women and children at the camp and then these Amalekites again came and attacked the women and came and attacked the camp and took all the women and children away without killing them but that was probably because it would be more profitable not to kill them. Uh, so it wasn't really an act of compassion there. But in these instances recorded, they highlight David's consistent habit of seeking God's direction before making a big decision. And the Apostle Paul wrote this, do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. And then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand Peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And the third point for uh, David and his uh, good behaviour was he was leading with compassion. David showed compassion in a number of ways and the way that he led. And uh, as I've already mentioned, David didn't repay evil with evil, with Saul chasing him, trying to 
kill him. Saul also had a disabled grandson whom instead of killing him, like many kings might have done, uh, yeah, to the previous, sorry, previous kings, David sought out uh, Saul's grandson, restored his family land to him and let him eat at his table for the rest of his life, which is an honourable thing to do, to eat at the king's table is a big deal. And that's what uh, David did for this guy. And also I've mentioned how the Amalekites attacked the camp, took everyone away, and David said to God, well, it's pretty bad, his men wanted to kill him, uh, which would be a really scary time to get overwhelmed and maybe hide in the baggage, as uh, (laughs) it would be tempting to do so. But what David did was he sought God. He said, should I go and pursue these lot? God said, go and get them. You'll get everything back. So he took all the men with him. They pursued them. They got them. But on the way there, there was a lot of people that were too tired to continue with that mission. They were exhausted. So they stayed there, kept their eyes on the stuff while everybody uh, pursued the Amalekites, took everything back. And then the people that took everything back said, those guys don't deserve anything because they didn't even come with us. You know, which is pretty bad. But David saw that that was bad. And he said, we're all one people. That's their stuff as well. And regardless of them not coming for it, we're all sharing the stuff equally. Again, so it might have pleased his men at the time to only take all the stuff for themselves. But what David did was he he showed compassion in his leadership for those that were too unwell to uh, continue. So just to recap some of Saul's issues here. Fearing people's opinions more than obeying God. Comparing ourselves to others and allowing insecurity to turn to jealousy and hatred. And then we can overcome them with David-type habits, so that's seeking and trusting in God. We can practice this habit through spending time in worship, prayer, and reading the Bible. Um, The second one, asking God what to do before making important decisions, not getting overwhelmed not turn into literally everything except God. You know, there's a temptation when the pressure's on to look to substances or food or anything to, to try to stop that feeling of fear and pain rather than turning to God. And what we can learn, obviously, from David's habits is that's the first place he was turning. And the third one is leading with compassion. As I've mentioned, David did make some big mistakes and... Uh, But still, the way David related to God was this. He wrote in one of the Psalms, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. And that's how um, David knew God. And we become like what we behold. And you wonder if David and his relationship with God, knowing that God is gracious, compassionate and loving, is what enabled him to lead with compassion. So showing compassion for others also allows people to see something of God in us. And as David acted compassionately towards those around him, it brought favour and trust for the people that he led. So as I mentioned earlier, you might be here today at a crossroads, wondering what to do about a big decision. So I just want to leave some space, really, and some time now for us to wait on God.
Thank you for watching. We hope you found this online service helpful and encouraging. If you'd like to find out more about Melton Vineyard or get in touch with us, our website is meltonvineyard.org.uk. And of course, you can find us every Sunday morning at 10:30 a.m. at John Fernley College on Scolford Road. If you're able to make it to one of those on-site services, we would love to meet you. In the meantime, may God bless you.